Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us in the latest webinar in Eno's Road to Recovery series, which brings you uh, leadership and transportation lessons for a post-COVID future. I'm Brianne Eby, a senior policy analyst at Eno, and today I'm looking forward to a discussion about paratransit service in this new normal environment for public transit. Uh, today's presenters are Judy Shanley, Assistant Vice President of Education and Youth Transition at Easter Seals. Judy is also the Easter Seals Director of the FTA-funded National Center for Mobility Management, where she manages fed federal projects, conducts research, and provides technical assistance for transportation coordination and mobility management. Judy will be joined by David Rischel, Principal at the Delta Services Group, a transit-focused consulting firm near Philadelphia. David chairs the APTA Access Committee's Transit and Paratransit Operations Subcommittee. Our presenters will talk about service modifications, considerations of um, new paratransit service models, and opportunities to embrace the voice of riders. Uh, just a quick administrative note, so our speakers will present for roughly 20 minutes or so, during which you can submit questions using the questions function through the webinar at any time. And we'll then go to about 20 to 25 minutes of Q&A, and you can, of course, also submit questions at that point. We'll try to hit as many of the questions as we can. With that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Judy, I think you're muted. <laughs> You'd think I learned that by now. Um, hi, I'm Judy Shanley. I'm with the National Office of the Easter Seals, and thank you to Brianne and thank you to Eno for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, we entitled this Opportunities to Consider because um, I think when David and I spoke about this topic, we understood this is what an opportune time to think about how we're doing paratransit, the services we provide, and how we could use this time of the differing changes that have occurred in the industry to improve or make it better. So really, we do consider this an opportunity. The next slide, I'll just run through a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Um, First, I'm gonna share with you a little about the National Center for Mobility Management, which is the project that I manage. And then we're gonna be talking about ABA paratransit service in, in two pieces, really the administration piece of it and eligibility, as well as the operations piece. And then as um, Brianne said, we're gonna have plenty of time for discussions and questions at the end. So on the next slide, wanted to give you an overview of what the National Center for Mobility Management is. You'll hear me call it NCMM for short. Um, we are a National Technical Assistance Center and we were funded in or started our existence in 2013. We're funded by the Federal Transit Administration and it's really it's operated by three organizations, one being Easter Seals, which is my organization. The um, other is the American Public Transportation Association which represents large urban transportation systems, and then the Community Transportation Association of America. We're funded through a cooperative agreement by the Federal Transit Administration. On the next slide, you'll see our mission. We help communities build coordination networks. We help um, communities, states, and regions with technical assistance to facilitate coordination. And one of the things we've been working on most recently is helping the Federal Transit Administration implementing the CCAM or the Coordination Council on Access and Mobility. So our mission is to help communities build uh, interrelated and integrated systems so that everybody has a ride when they need a ride. On the next slide, we've um, because we're at the national level, we've had some great uh, opportunities to look at what's happening in the paratransit industry. Um, and even before COVID, we, we've noticed that there's often a disconnect between the services that an agency might deliver related to paratransit and those services that are delivered in other um, uh, organizational units of an agency. So it almost seems like in the administration of the service, it's disjointed. There's not a connection between those, um, between the two services. And we've also noticed that there's always questions that the field and riders ask about the operational part of it. So asking questions regarding the eligibility process and the verification process. Are we, is this the right mechanism? Is this the right system for um, determining eligibility for this service? Right sizing has come up and where we're, we're 
we're hearing that um, some individuals are um, not comfortable with the kind of mode or the kind of vehicle that's being used in their transportation. For instance, the American Council of the Blind did a survey, our colleague Ron Brooks did a survey of, of their members and um, the members indicated that it was important for them if they didn't need a wheelchair to have a non-wheelchair accessible van be their transportation. So make, making sure that the vehicle type and mode is consistent with the needs of the rider. The other um, operational thing that we're, we've seen over time is scheduling. The, the advanced registration, the 48 hour, 24 hour in advance scheduling of paratransit service has really created difficulties for the spontaneous travel that riders like. And then looking at efficiency, you know, is it efficient to be transporting one person or two people on a service? Is there any opportunity to mix uses of the service? Does it have to be dedicated for a single purpose? So these are the, the kind of operational questions that I think the field has been asking for a very long time. Um, and on the next slide, um, David's going to share with you some things that we're seeing since COVID. Yeah, thank you, Judy. Uh, when this whole thing hit, uh, we uh, in the Access Committee at APTA started to convene some working meetings uh, with transit folks to see what's going on out there. How are people reacting to this um, pandemic? And one of the things that we found immediately is that everybody reported that their ridership is down. We all know this. I mean, in some cases, 80% is not uncommon. Um, everybody also suspended their in-person eligibility processes. Uh, obviously, it's just not appropriate to be meeting face-to-face -face these days. And that's created a lot of difficulty. In fact, I think we've already got a couple of questions relating to eligibility, so we'll talk about that some more. Um, another big impact has been, although Paratrans has been able to keep running, concerns about social distancing has led them to, in most cases, restrict uh, like one person per sedan or perhaps two people per, per cutaway van. So that's been a pretty significant reduction in capacity. And because demand is down so much, we haven't felt the impact of that. But that's something I'll talk about more that is is going to become an issue as people start coming back. And one of the things that transit has done that has been a real positive that I kind of feel like we haven't done a very good job um, letting the community really know is that transit's really stepped up, especially paratransit, to deliver meals and to do a lot of really non-transit services with the idle fleets. And that's been a huge benefit to a lot of communities out there. And hopefully that's built a lot of goodwill in our communities as we've really stepped beyond what we traditionally do. Um, and we've also noticed a lot of destinations changing. Of course, the um, day programs that people often attend, they've stopped going to those almost entirely, um, and a lot more trips going to medical. So um, those are some immediate changes that we saw. And next slide, please. And as the, as the COVID-19 has stretched on, and we sort of have come down from the initial shock, what we're seeing is passengers are starting to come back. In some systems, uh, ridership is up to 50%, even more in some cases. Um, and systems are having to look at discontinuing those meal services and those kind of extra transit activities that they've been doing and uh, working with their communities about how to do that in a way that's not disruptive. Um, also, I think transit systems have moved back from just saying um, yes to everybody who applies for eligibility and looking at some abbreviated eligibility processes, like doing telephone screening instead of in-person, which we can talk about some more. Um, an ongoing problem with systems, particularly systems that rely on taxis and uh, other partial providers, is that this has really been a body blow to that industry. Uh, their revenues are down, not just with transit, but with their regular general public services. And in, in some cases, they're facing an existential crisis. And that has big implications for the industry nationwide. Um, and of course, as people start coming back in, if we've had a reduction in our capacity because of social distancing requirements, a lot of systems are looking at their paratransit system really only has about 80% of the capacity it had pre-COVID-19. So as passengers start coming back in, they're concerned about hitting capacity because they can't load the vehicles the way they used to, 
And it's really encouraging folks to look at non-dedicated options as uh, overflow service, uh, more flexibility. So that's what we're hearing from people of how they're dealing with this. And uh, we'll talk about some more things uh, about looking forward. Uh, Judy? Sure. Um, the next slide um, is a cartoon, which I think represents how we hope the field will react to improving paratransit service. It's a picture of um, people around, it looks like a board meeting and they're talking and there's two um, charts on the wall with profit line going down and sales line going down. And the caption reads, what if we don't change it all and something magical just happens? Well, on the next slide, I think we all can agree that magic isn't going to happen and we need to be deliberative about looking at the system, looking at our, deliver our way that we're delivering, administrating paratransit service, looking at the way operations of paratransits are provided and make some real changes. So as we're talking with systems around the country and technical assistance, these are some of the questions that we encourage um, systems to ask in terms of the administration of the service. So is there alignment between the paratransit operations services and other programs within your agency? Um, I mentioned the disjointedness and the disconnect and with all this innovation going on, mobility on demand, mobility as a service, hopefully you're thinking of how paratransit fit into that whole integrated system. Are the people designing those services talking? Do they have opportunities to collaborate and to innovate together? Are you engaging riders in every step of the way as decision makers, as um, problem solvers in the process? The information that ACP got, ACP got um, from riders that are the users of the service has been instrumental in identifying the kinds of issues and the, the needs and concerns. So always engage riders. Are you looking at your eligibility determined process? Does it have to be set in stone? You want to be obviously in all of this reflective of the ADA requirements, but do you need one eligibility determination process? Um, they said that um, you know we're looking at video and audio um, eligibility. Is that a possibility moving forward as we are post-COVID and the systems are um, becoming our new normal? And then looking at you know, non-traditional funding sources, I'm gonna be talking about some Department of Transportation resources, but are we looking beyond the box, outside of the box? Does the funding for paratransit always have to come from the transit agency or DOT kinds of resources? Um, and look at, um, the overall system, we, we know that um, the, the issues associated with um, capacity are gonna be really important. So how does your paratransit system reflect those needs to ensure this efficiency and in the way you administrate and operate? And what is your external message? How are people learning about the service? Is there clear expectations about what your service can provide and how has COVID changed that? Those are just some of the administration type questions. Um, and the next slide, David will talk about some of the operational questions that you could ask. Yeah, thanks, Judy. Uh, to continue, uh, think about vehicles. Uh, and it's kind of ironic that the transit industry was doing almost all vans and cutaways and kind of was, has been moving a lot more toward passenger uh, cars. Um, in the short term, that's kind of backfiring because of social distancing, because you can only put one person in a vehicle. Um, but thinking about after COVID, um, having a fleet mix gives you more options and uh, often can reduce your operating costs uh, if you're using a combination of uh, lift equipped vehicles and non lift equipped vehicles to match your passenger needs. Um, and mixing passengers more and more, uh, there's both software and really philosophical changes in the industry that are helping us to think that we don't have to have these stovepipe services where only one person uh, handles this and we don't mix any passengers together. Um, that's just not really necessary anymore. And you're limiting your own flexibility if you keep your programs walled uh, apart like that. Um, scheduling processes, uh, the more we move to paratransit thinking of uh, trip by trip eligibility decision making, the more flexibility again you can have as, uh, as a manager putting folks in different services to meet different needs on a trip by trip basis. 
and uh, using your vehicles in a more flexible way as we kind of already talked about, uh, employing them in different services, having a, uh, a, a mix of different contractors that can provide different services uh, for different programs. And uh, same day service is another thing that I think um, some of the TNCs out there are sort of reconditioning demand response passengers to expect this, whether we like it or not. Uh, the expectation is if I can contact one of these services using an app, um, why can't paratransit do this as well? So our passengers are beginning to um, ask for and expect this kind of service, at least for some of their trips. And um, this also is facilitated by direct communication with passengers, which paratransit has always had. But especially now, um, that's even become more important as you have to vary services and you have to talk about limitations on services because of COVID. Um, and again, technology is the key, whether it's your reservation and scheduling system or whether it's uh, apps you're using to communicate with passengers, really reassessing your technology suite and looking at the capabilities you have to do more than just demand or reserve and schedule paratransit trips. Can you look at a broader array of services? Um, Sustaining hygiene practices is uh, putting a strain on all systems right now. Uh, finding the money and the personnel to be able to do these kinds of things. Um, right now, it may be taking resources away from other things you'd like to do, uh, but when those requirements go away, think about how you can employ those resources in a different way to make your service more flexible. Um, and one of the things that I've been really impressed with, and this kind of goes back to the a conversation about using paratransit for meal delivery and things like that. There are uh, communication linkages happening now between transit and other parts of the community, the health department, the city government at different levels uh, that have been very impressive. And those can really bear fruit in the future as you're looking at how to redefine your services after this is all over. So don't let those uh, atrophy. Keep that communication going. Uh, next slide, please. So after COVID-19, I think the one word to throw out here is flexibility. Think of flexibility as your friend in every single way in terms of eligibility, service delivery, all of it. So talking about eligibility, the industry has already been moving away from this simple monolithic paratransit yes, no. And I think that's a really good thing. And the more you can continue to move toward trip-by-trip decision-making and think of paratransit eligibility, specifically ADA, not as a yes-no decision, but more of an if-when decision that uh, give passengers more of an array of options that they can provide. And one of the ironies is uh, working with the system down in Florida um, at Palmtran and They've been talking about uh, passengers interested in paratransit because of social distancing and because of ridership on transit buses right now, you actually have better social distancing on big buses than you do on paratransit. So making passengers aware of these things can help inform their decisions about which mode they'd like to travel on. Um, and emphasizing mainstream mobility, I mean, that's the, that's the point. We just had the anniversary of the ADA and the point wasn't to create a nationwide paratransit fleet. It was to create a nationwide system of accessible transit, and we've done that. And when we think about paratransit and eligibility, we should be making sure that we don't just talk about paratransit, but we talk about all of the other services out there, all the mainstream services that are fully accessible now. And one of the things I think for paratransit operators, especially as they're looking at this um, prospect of a reduced fleet capacity with people coming back in to use the service, the concern is how are we going to meet demand? If, if we really get back to 100% ridership, I only have 80% capacity to handle that 100% ridership. What am I going to do? Some systems already have non-dedicated optional services available, but this is the time to be thinking about that if you don't, or if you do have them to expand them, to give yourselves more options. So as people come back in, you're not just thinking about serving them with a dedicated fleet. You're thinking about a multitude of options, maybe even beyond ADA paratransit, mobility on demand type services that can meet their needs in a more flexible way. So um, that's what we see coming forward. Judy? 
Um, David, you mentioned the relationships that people have established um, with organizations with whom they may not have had a relationship before. I was working with an agency, a human service organization in New Hampshire, and he said because of COVID that he established relationships with some HHS grantees in his state to establish this meal service delivery program. And he would never have had those opportunities to figure out how they could join forces and how they could collaborate collaborate on funding to support um, access for meals for people um, unless it had been the situation. So he was um, saying how he was excited that he's going to sustain that relationship after all this is over. And on the next slide, there's opportunities to do that. I mentioned the Coordinating Council on Access and Mobility. Um, for those of you who don't know, the CCAM is a federal initiative. It was established years ago, but has been resurrected through the FAST Act, which requires federal aid. There's 11 federal agencies that have anything to do with transportation. It requires that they coordinate and collaborate through this, their service for Vision. And as a result of that, there's some um, activities and, and materials that FTA has had to produce to respond to the requirement in the FAST Act. One is a program inventory. On this, at this URL, you can find 110 federal programs across 11 agencies that fund transportation. So maybe one of those programs can support a meals program or um, transporting other passengers on your vehicle. Um, the other thing that FTA just produced was a federal fund braiding guide, which um, you can do a, a search to find the federal agencies that you can use their monies to match FTA dollars. So typically in 50 through 10, there's an 80-20 match. You can find those programs that will support an incoming match for FTA dollars, but you also can find those programs that you could use FTA monies to fund them externally. Um, and then finally, they just produced a cost-sharing policy, which has flexibility in terms of um, the, the ridership, and it, it um, permits, and obviously state legislation, state regulations supersede this, but it might be that you can mix passengers. You can have passengers in a paratransit vehicle that are funded by different organizations. They're going to different places. They're going on different trip purposes. But we're in a time now where there's so much innovation and as Dave said, flexibility that use these resources to really learn the flexibilities that you do have. On the next slide, I just shared some, um, these are the federal technical assistance centers that FTA funds, ours is on the top. Um, there's a National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, which is a partnership with Easter Seals and Ann Foray, and focuses on Section 5310 work um, and has lots of great resources regarding the ADA and the legislative and legal requirements. Probably familiar with the National RTAP program, which has produced a really great cost allocation tool. We have NCMM has a cost allocation tool. So if you're thinking about mixing passengers, you might want to use a tool like that to help you ensure that you're attributing costs in the appropriate way. The Shared Use Mobility Center is a repository of information for all these innovations, including how agencies are doing paratransit. And finally, the newest center is the National Center for Applied Transit Technology, which is a project at the Community Transportation Association and is focusing on technology. So the technology for data sharing, the technology for scheduling. So take advantage of these federal programs. There are many of the resources um, that come out of them are free. They provide technical assistance. They may have grant programs that you could take advantage of so that you can fund some of these pilot programs that you're doing. Um, we included our contact information on the next slide. Uh, Dave and I are always available to you and we, Dave and I are um, both on the APTA access committee and have access to a lot of really smart people. So, um, you know, if we're not able to address your questions, we can hook you and connect you with other people that can. So um, thank you so much again for um, having us to talk to you. And now we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. Great, thank you so much, Judy and David. Um, we still have, I think, about 20 minutes left for Q&A. So feel free to continue submitting questions. We've already had um, a bunch come in, so I'll try to hit as many of them as I can. I might be kind of combining some, some common themes that have come up. Um, but we'll, we'll get started with that right now. So 
Um, I'll start with one here on um, the process for uh, eligibility, which is something that you talked a little bit about. And um, it sounds like, you know, somebody said it seems like many providers are moving back to in-person eligibility. So I'd be curious to hear if, if that's something that you're seeing, um, but also just in terms of of assessments and, and professional verification. Um, would you, you know, do you think it's smart to, to reinstate professional verification on a more limited basis um, than was previously uh, the practice? Um, or like, I guess, how do you see that, that um, process moving in the future? Dave, Is that for you me? Want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, well, two parts to the answer. I think pre-COVID, the industry had been moving more away from kind of uh, paper applications to in-person assessments. I think that's been driven by the realization that paratransit eligibility is really a much more nuanced um, process. It, it, if you're really doing what the regulations and what we morally should be doing is figuring out what do passengers really need on a trip by trip basis. And it's hard to get that from a piece of paper. The best way to do that is to have some kind of interaction with people. Um, and I think also there has been a move sort of away from this medical model that a lot of people initially adopted of just send the application to your doctor or the doctor fills it out, sends it back. That really didn't give us what we needed either. So we've moved, been moving toward a conversation with applicants. With COVID, that's been harder because you can't bring folks in for that conversation. And I think a lot of systems, the initial reaction was, well, we're just going to put a hold on everything because we didn't know how long this was going to be. Now that it looks like we're going to be in this situation for months further, what systems seem to be doing is modifying their interview process to do it by phone or by video. Um, often video is more challenging because folks don't have that capability, but everybody can do it by phone. And uh, systems are using professional verification or medical verification kind of on an as needed basis. Um, but it seems like it's been pretty effective for systems to be able to conduct a pretty robust um, conversation by phone. Um, a couple of the systems I've talked to, we're, we're actually working with, uh, with Pinellas in uh, the PSTA in Pinellas, Florida. They're implementing a new system and they're going directly to a by telephone uh, interview process. Um, I've also worked with Los Angeles. They're doing their interviews by phone now. So a lot of systems are doing that very effectively. And uh, I think using medical verification as needed. And what some systems are also doing is they're modifying some of their um, determination time periods. So they're saying, well, we're gonna do a, a phone assessment of your eligibility now. And instead of giving you a three-year window, we're going to make that a year and a half or a year. And then if we need to, we'll bring you in for a more thorough assessment later as needed. So uh, I think we're seeing a lot of different approaches out there, but um, phone seems to be the favorite at the moment. Yeah, and I think in, in my conversations with transit agencies and the eligibility determined process that um, and, and moving toward a distance model um, and also an eclectic model. So not just relying on one piece of information, but as Dave said, you're relying on interview and phone and uh, a functional piece. You're asking people about how they get around, but the, the end result is right more often than it's wrong. You are identifying um, whether a person is appropriate for a paired transit, initially appropriate or not appropriate for a paired transit. So I haven't heard that transit agencies and the, the differing ways that they're doing eligibility or verification ha have resulted in any, any bad kind of decisions. It seems to be the decisions that are aligned with the real needs of the passengers. And that's what this is all about, is identifying the, the valid needs of riders and ensuring that people have options. Great, thanks. Um, and Judy, maybe I'll start with you for this one, but David, feel free to chime in as well. Um, so next question, there have been a few about um, the paratransit workforce. So how has the pandemic affected paratransit drivers? Um, somebody asked about the status of volunteer driver programs. Um, are, are we still seeing you know, those in effect? Um, what safety protocols are in place for drivers? How has driver availability changed over time, if at all? Um, so just kind of Speak to some of the, the changes that we're seeing in um, the workforce. Yeah, I have been really heartened by 
um, transit agencies, human service organizations um, that have drivers and operators, how, how protective they've been about their workforce. Um, there has certainly been cuts uh, across systems. We, they've talked about the low ridership. If you don't need an operator, you may there may be some layoffs. But I've been excited about the way that agencies are using um, operators and drivers, where they're re re tuning them to other positions, whether it's be cleaning vehicles or doing operations within the administration side of a transit agency. So they're not driving, but they're doing everything they can to protect their jobs and not laying them off. And I think, you know, what we've learned during this time is that um, the workforce has to be nimble, just like our systems have been nimble and flexible, the, the operators and drivers have to be nimble and that requires professional development by agencies, maybe in new ways that they hadn't thought of before. Dave? Yeah, just to add to that, I, I agree with everything you said. I've also been impressed with how transit systems have tried to be creative about how to modify some of their operating procedures to be sure they're accommodating passengers and still protecting the drivers. In fact, um, a shout out to CTAA. I thought they had a really good um, bit of guidance early on about how to manage the securement of a, a wheelchair or a wheel mobility device on a bus of encouraging the driver to communicate with the person when they're still out on the sidewalk if they can and understand what the person's needs are so that whenever the person boards, there isn't a need to talk to each other close by. You know, just simple creative things like that, which I think can be adopted by a lot of systems. That's a, we've been trying to get that information out. And there was a, a good question that I don't know the answer to, and I would like to hear from folks about volunteer drivers. We haven't heard much about that, and uh, they often play a big role, particularly in kind of smaller and rural systems and uh, I, I, that's something we should explore more because that certainly is a factor that uh, is going to impact capacity as people come back to the systems. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we've um, seen more of is education, um, education to passengers, education to the public. Because as a writer, we we all have a responsibility to behave in certain ways, to wear our masks, to social distance. And so more and more transit agencies are providing that education. So there's an expectation by the rider of what they can expect once they get on the vehicle. And, and I think we've seen some really creative ways. I know here in Chicago, um, RTA and CTA and PACE and Metro have been amazing in terms of their educational materials being presented in different ways and appealing to different audiences. But, you know, just the writer has a responsibility in all of this too. And so transit agencies are using many mechanisms to educate those writers. But I agree with you, Dave. Volunteer driver programs have, have too been, um, you know, cut in some places. Um, they've been retooled, rethought of, and different. We have volunteer driver programs that are they're delivering meals where they previously were taking people to healthcare medical appointments, and now they're um, being used in different ways. But um, it's an important part of a big integrated continuum of transportation service and volunteer driver programs. Yeah, the, the education point is maybe a good segue to talking about community engagement. So um, how has the process of community engagement changed to receive input from, um, from writers or, or from the community um, and you know, also to share important information about service changes? Um, and, and another question related to that is what does outreach to those without internet access um, or maybe with different language or literacy abilities, um, what does that look like during this time? David, maybe you can start there. Sure. Um, I, I've actually heard quite a mixed bag um, in this regard. One of the advantages that paratransit has over other modes of transit is that we talk to our riders almost every day. So there is a way using just our normal telephone interaction to disseminate information out on hold messages, those kinds of things. That's pretty effective. Um, I think a, a, a new piece that has come out has been this uh, sustained and substantive interaction with other organizations in the community, with other government departments, um, and with transit communicating to the public about how they're modifying their operations during this time, talking to folks about, you know, if you think you're COVID positive, please don't ride on our system, not just paratransit, but the system as a whole. 
and sort of trying to manage that balance between um, serving the customer, but then having responsibility for the safety of customers as a common carrier, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, and I know there's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one outreach uh, to organizations with the customers that I'm working with, uh, like transit management, talking to centers and management staff much more than they have in the past. Um, the, the challenge of reaching people without technology is something I think we need to continue to explore more. Um, I haven't heard it come up as a big issue in a lot of systems, but I can certainly see how it could be. You know, this whole notion of um, coordination and community engagement is music to my ears because the work that the, um, my project, the National Center for Mobility Management does is bring together human services and transit professionals um, in, in ways that are fulfilling to both audiences. And we've seen that, uh, just like Dave said, we've seen in communities where, um, you know, they're wanting to get the voice of riders with disabilities of different segments of the population, they're, they're reaching out to those organizations to get their input in meaningful ways about how the system can be changed or improved. So um, hopefully those strategies that have used, I know in, in Chicago, we have a coalition through the mayor's office of people with disabilities, as well as the Center for Independent Living that's looking at um, recovery and um, getting using transportation back. And their um, CTA and RTA has been really, really diligent about ensuring that it's reaching those um, you know, areas of the community that might not have internet and might not receive information in traditional ways. They've been very deliberative. They're, they put themselves in, in community in local stores and um, retail businesses where people that um, are shopping and they're going into and they're disseminating information that way. So um, by being in the communities where a diverse range of riders are has been really important. Um, we'll move on next to some some operational changes um, questions, but you know, things that you're seeing that are, are new um, in terms of delivering service during the pandemic. Um, so one question came in about if, if an agency eliminates fixed route lines, does that reduce coverage for complementary paratransit? And whoever uh, maybe- Yeah, I think- Sure. From just a regulatory standpoint, um, I think the answer would be yes. You'd want to consider from a customer service standpoint whether you want to do that. Um, what some systems I think are doing is looking at if they're going to be discontinuing transit service, uh, fixed route transit service, maybe they replace it with some kind of an all-call demand response service that can serve both needs. Um, but strictly speaking, from an ADA compliance standpoint, if you stop doing paratransit or stop doing fixed route in an area you wouldn't be obligated to do paratransit in that area either and again i've seen agencies that kind of go above and beyond you know that thinking about just like you said david they've been innovative and even if a fixed route service may be cut or or changed that 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 way to get that individual with disability to a destination they need has been Terrific. Um, you know, in Chicago here, they've been um, CTA has been transporting healthcare workers to hospitals and medical facilities, and so um, they've been very community-minded and community engaged. So they've gone above and beyond the paratransit, the legal requirement of the ADA, which is great to see. A couple of questions have come in about um, how you know we're seeing agencies eliminating fare collection for for fixed route services. How has fare collection changed for for paratransit services? Um, maybe start with Judy. Well, you know, um, I, I think most of the um, the paratransit services is done electronically and perhaps billed outside of the transit vehicle itself but just like fixed route where um, they're kind of eliminating the fare box because of COVID concerns if a, a paratransit vehicle has a fare box system or some cash collection system on board those two have been affected by this um, you know the way that people pay for service is also under consideration you know and and um, people that are unbanked, it's a consideration if they don't have the cash to pay. So David, what do you, I mean, you're, you're, I know you're working on this topic particularly, is there anything that you've seen that, about fair collection? Um, 
Yeah, just a few things to add. I think, of course, the the key thing from an ADA compliance standpoint is if you've eliminated fares on your fixed route, you have to eliminate yeah. them on ADA paratransit as well. You can't charge for one and not charge for the other. Um, but beyond that, uh, this to me feels like a very good example of uh, using this crisis to investigate something that could improve your system in the future. Um, because there used to be this feeling of, well, I'd like to go with uh, some kind of non-cash option, but I don't have the money for the infrastructure for smart cards or that kind of thing. But there are now third-party apps that uh, you can subscribe to that are, are very easy uh, for a lot of customers to access. And you simply make them optional. You don't make them required so that at least you can reduce the number of people who have to handle uh, cash. And there's a lot of creative options out there that once you've implemented them, make your life easier and are safer under the current conditions. Um, but on, a lot of systems have been, um, have reduced or eliminated fares initially, but some systems are beginning to come back, mm -hmm. um, beginning to come back and collect fares again. So I think that this is something that is gonna be an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. That was maybe a nice segue to talking more in depth about partnerships. So how do you see the role of um, partnering with you know, new mobility providers, um, ride hailing services, et cetera, to deliver paratransit services? Um, how might that change? Do you think it'll be an increased um, uh, presence in, in um, the role of delivering transit, paratransit services? Um, especially you know given that that ride hailing services are experiencing their own financial challenges right now what um what does that look like into the future no the um the federal transit administration has funded a lot of pilot projects over the years and some are specifically focused on uh, differing paratransit delivery and some of those have involved ride share programs i think it's going to continue to grow um i we can't negate though the importance of training um you know, and driver awareness and understanding of particular disability issues and conditions. I think that's got to be paramount. Um, the safety issues associated with having drivers that understand disability and implications of varying disabilities is something that we can't forget and can't undermine. But I think that our use of varying modes, um, varying ways of delivery is going to continue to grow. Yeah, I, I, if I could chime in there, I completely agree that there's a, um, there's a model, actually the folks that, at Pinellas that we're working with right now, um, they have a really good approach to this where they're looking at ADA paratransit in addition to several other mobility on demand options. So when passengers come in, they're offered a variety of options, not just uh, bus or paratransit. And that gives you flexibility. And I see that kind of thing expanding significantly and frankly, it's an opportunity for the TNCs to uh, get into the transit space even more. Um, but I'm sure Judy would agree with this. One of the things that I think is an opportunity for them to work on is addressing accessibility. If they want to become a bigger player in the transit industry, in the transit market, making sure that uh, you know it's easy. I don't use a mobility device. I can get a car quickly uh, using a TNC. But if I used a wheelchair, can I have that equivalent level of service? And I think that's a growth area for that industry too. And this is a perfect time for them to really address that head on and become a big player in the industry. So there's an opportunity for both sides to, uh, to gain from this. Mm -hmm. It's giving riders choice and giving riders the choice to know that they're gonna have safe and reliable and accessible transportation. Um, the, the RTD in Denver, through their app, you can access an Uber lot ride or a Lyft ride or access the traditional fixed route system. The rider is basing the decision as to which mode to use based upon whether is cost more important, is time more important? What is the criteria by which you choose a ride at a certain time and that's what these creative partnerships and these new innovations are looking at there's a lot of companies out there we've done we have some products on our website which have like considerations for um tra uh, transit network companies and shared ride service and just some things to think about as you're establishing partnerships and the accessibility issue and the equivalent service issue are, are huge and important determinants of that partnership. Great, we are just about out of time, but I have um, one more, more question for you, which is 
um, do we know the extent to which paratransit operators have received federal funding to date? And what, um, I guess, you know, future opportunities are there for federal funding? Or what are you pushing for in terms of um, receiving more assistance? Maybe start with David. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that, to be honest with you. There, uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, systems about like the meal service delivery. Um, my question is like, that's wonderful, but are you guys getting paid for that? And the answer is, well, no, but we hope we will. So I think there are a lot, there's a lot of deal making going on in the background to try to cover costs. And it is a very delicate time for the industry, to put it mildly, uh, you know, with uh, tax revenues down at the local and state level and with fare box down, it is an economic crisis for the industry. So uh, I think that's still a work in progress. Uh, Judy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and I specifically don't know um, the question about federal funding, but what it, what it facilitates in my mind is thinking that we need to be more conscientious of the costs. We need to have a system in whatever model we're providing that we know how much each rider is costing. What is that trip cost and what system do we have for receiving payment for this system? So it kind of bodes to the cost allocation system and being very clear about the actual cost, the actual expenses for that person. So um, I don't know the answer to that question. It is a good question, but the FTA um, has put out really great Q and A's on its website in terms of some of this flexibility. I know that um, in terms of meal delivery and other purposes for, for their FTA vehicles that um, they've extended the deadline, I think until December. So agencies can continue to use their vehicles with flexibility, but go to the FTA website and look at that guidance because it's really comprehensive and well thought. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Judy and David. That was really really um insightful and i think we had a lot of questions come in a lot of people interested in getting in touch so um just a reassurance that these um slides and the presentation will be posted on eno's website after the fact so if anybody has more information or more questions you can find more information there um and i encourage everybody to look into our next webinar which will be um next week august 4th and that one is on transit innovation in the time of covid um so with that i'll say thank you all very much and um uh yeah See you soon. Thank you. Enjoy it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.